Jim Hutt, uh, how many uh, Farsi words do you still remember? That from time to time you have the opportunity to, to speak to Hamid and Maria. Uh, so you, you still have some better repertoire of those words, right? Well, that's right. But uh, not as many as I would like. <laughs> But uh, thank you for conducting this in English. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. So let's get started. Okay. Um. Okay. So um, Dr. Lakeman is a well-known, uh, outstanding researcher in the field of uh, child psychiatry, pediatrics. Um, neuroscience, uh, etc. cetera. He's done um, a wide range of uh, seminal works, um, mostly in the field of OCD and Tourette syndrome. He's uh, one of the pioneers in this field. Um, and actually we owe most of uh, what we know about these disorders, uh, thanks to his wonderful and long, long time, his lifetime actually, I guess, um, contribution to the field. Um, as part of the course we have on developmental psychopathology, um, uh, as part, as first part of this um, uh, presentation, um, we, uh, we, we have uh, a presentation but, but by one of our colleagues, Dr. Mariam Afridi, about developmental psychopathology in relation to evolutionary perspectives. Uh, since uh, Dr. Lechman is one of the uh, pioneers in this field as well, so um, it would be wonderful for us to have him as, um, as someone giving us feedback uh, and uh, answering some of the questions we might have in this regard. So um, Dr. Mohazadi, please, uh, the floor is yours. Um. Hi, uh, I'm Maria Mohaber. Hello, uh, and uh, I'm resident of psychiatry. Uh, at first, I should say uh, good afternoon, and maybe I should say good morning to some of the our audience overseas, like the professor himself. Uh, I wish to thank Professor Lechman for letting me summarize the wonderful chapter he wrote and his patience listening while I'm presenting. It's a great honor and absolute privilege to sit in front of a first-rank well-known scientist as a president of psych psychiatry. Uh, as we have limited time, uh, so let's go on. And uh, I share my slides. I think that's okay. Uh, uh, we are going to talk about developmental psychopathology and think about how useful are evolutionary perspectives. In the following 20 minutes after introduction, we will discuss the goals of evolutionary explanations and the mechanisms that may account for the persistence of discrete forms of psychopathology and conclusion as last part. DSM-5, which is the common language of the psychiatrists in all over the world, refines psychopathological states as categorical entities that are modeled after discrete medical disorders. While it is serviceable and well-suited to today's medical market, but the weaknesses are clear today. Many of the criteria are just a reflection of a committee of experts' view and it ignores the dimensional properties of many syndromes. Also, it fails to provide a dynamic framework. In evolutionary explanation, the principal goal is to provide a coherent framework to view persistent maladaptive behavior patterns in human population. Uh, whenever we talk about evolution, we can't ignore Darwin's principle of natural selection, which posits three points. Uh, the variation exists among individuals, 
those individuals who exhibit useful traits in the struggle for life have different reproductive fitness. And a differential inheritance of those factors that gave, that gave rise to the favorable traits. But the persistence of psychopathology appears to be paradoxical, given the editing power of natural selection. Some say that maybe some forms of behavior that are generally considered to be psychopathological and maladaptive can be considered adaptive within certain conditions, and they enhance an individual's reproductive fitness. It seems that the cascade of evolutionary events which are responsible for the emergence of our species, on the other hand, uh, makes us vulnerable to certain forms of psychopathology. Um, by this introduction, let's explain the mechanisms that may account for the persistence of discrete forms of psychopathology. First of them is failure of conserved patterns of behavior to develop normally. Um, if it depends on the normal expression of non-specific genes at the correct time and place in developing brain, then we remain vulnerable to events, to the events which can disrupt the developmental uh, of these neural circuits. Some examples of this failure are fragile syndrome, prodel willi syndrome, Angelman syndrome, and ASD. Uh, in this picture, you see the typical face of a person with fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome is a good example of single gene disorders, which is caused by an expansion of trinucleotide CGG repeats on the promoter region. Many of the genetic mut mutations responsible for human disease occur in regulatory regions of the genome that aren't conserved across the other mammalian or primate species. Um, prader willi syndrome, in conjunction with Angelman syndrome, represent the best examples of genomic imprinting in humans. There are three main molecular mechanisms that result in prader willi syndrome. Paternal deletion, maternal uniparental disomy, and imprinting defect. Angelman syndrome is resulted by the loss of expression of two maternally imprinted genes. A premutation uh, repeats uh, lesser than 200 and more than uh, 50 expands to a full mutation only when it is transmitted by a female. So the daughters of a male with a premutation uh, pre have only a premutation and remain unaffected. So this mechanism ensures the passage on genes from one generation to the next. To have a better picture, just imagine a person driving a car without lights at night to avoid getting pulled over by the cops. It seems that genomic imprinting has allowed mammalian species to alter the dosage of particular genes and sculpt their pattern of expression using non-Mendelian mechanism. Monoallelic expression, either maternal or paternal, provides a clear source of stability amidst the temporal and spatial complexity that characterizes the programming sequence associated with human CNS development. Uh, Presser examined the hypothesis that some genes associated with ASD did in fact enhance reproductive fitness. Sorry. For example, during times when nutritional resources were sparse, those who could demand the poop and look for the sources by themselves were at an advantage. The reserve also claimed that the most severe cases of ASD may be due to the assertive mating. Uh, the other important uh, uh, aspect of ASD is that uh, environmental insults can increase the likelihood of ASD. Some examples of these environmental insults are father being over the age of 50, the immigrant state of the mother, prenatal nutrition, pregnancy and birth complications, and gestational diabetes. Uh, the next mechanism for the persistence of psychopathology 
is this regulation of conserved neurobehavioral systems. If normal behavior patterns are initiated at an inappropriate time or of too high an intensity or are in turn of in timely fashion, this could lead to, con to a consistent phenotype of maladaptive behavior. Major depression and OCD are the examples that we're going to talk about. Darwin in 1872 argued that anxiety and fear are evolved adaptive responses evident in our mammalian ancestors. This provided selective advantage to our ancestors by altering aspects of appearance, I mean, um, facial expression, bodily cues, so they were able to alter, to alert the other members of the group about the imminent danger. And it put them to survive. It helped them to survive. Uh, the psychic distress informs the sufferer that something needs to change and perhaps be avoided in the future. For example, if you don't feel the psychic distress, you won't avoid a venomous snake which can kill you. Also, psychic distress can inform others that you need help and support. And it helps the sufferer to disengage from the commitment to the unreachable goals. A depressed mood, pessimism, and lack of motivation may provide a fitness advantage by inhibiting dangerous behaviors. Another point is analytical rumination. Psychic distress provides a mechani mechanism for the individuals to engage in sustained analysis of complex problems until a solution is reached. Um, obsessive compulsive symptoms are ancient alarm systems that may serve well our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Beginning in the second year of life, most normally developing children display a variety of intrusive thoughts, habits, and routines, some of which closely resemble the behaviors associated with OCD. Older children are concerning with dirt, cleanliness, or neatness. Bedtime fears, um, like fear of the dark or monsters, are related to hoarding objects. Fear of death is significantly associated with a strong attachment to a specific object. Uh, at the initiation of uh, parenting, preoccupation about safety and cleanliness of the neonates accompanies by some compulsive harm avoidant behavior. The mother would check uh, the habits and the uh, urination and every aspect of the, uh, her neonates several times. This may, uh, this may bother her, but it helps the neonate to survive. In conclusion, obsessive compulsive symptoms appear normally during in the course of development and increase reproductive thickness. Um, the next mechanism that we are going to talk about is about environmental shifts and the value of diversity at the population. Uh, environment never stops changing and it changes every aspect of our life. In contrast to our ancestors, we are living in modern societies and instead of hunting and gathering, we can sit on our comfortable chairs and order everything by our small smartphones. As a result, some behavioral traits might, make, might become less adaptive today, like ADHD, which is known for hyperactivity, attention deficit, and impulsivity re response ready. Uh, just imagine one of our ancestors who confronts the angry lion while looking for the food. Analyzing the power of that lion's jaws or how he can negotiate the way out won't help him. He has to run. Just the response ready approach can help. Uh, when every change in the environment, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> when every change in the environment could mean a threat or opportunity, being distractible is an advantage. 
a person who distracts by every small motion or sound will realize the danger before the others. So his chance for survival uh, increases. Um, now also seeking and looking for resource rich environments is another advantage of these people. William and Taylor designed a program that allowed them to change the predictability of individuals. And they concluded that environmental variability reduces the predictability in population. There is a class of tasks in which unpredictable behavior by minority of individuals optimize results for the group. The reproductive bias helped population to cope with rapid environmental change. The fourth mechanism is co-optation of conserved neurobiological systems. Our neurobehavioral systems are dependent on specific neurobiological substrates uh, and are critical for our body and every function of our body and brain. Some exogenous substances lead to addiction by hijacking these pathways. Uh, addiction and substance use disorder provide a compelling uh, example of how our evolutionary history has left us vulnerable to certain forms of psychopathology. And the fifth mechanism is evolutionary arms race. Our long um, uh, our long-standing evolutionary relationship with bacterial and viral pathogens have shaped our genome and our vulnerability to disease. In psychiatry, these effects include post-infection autoimmune disorders like Sydenheim chorea and Panda. But this pandas is not that lovely, that lovely cute pandas. PANDAS is a short for pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection. It's manifest by sudden overnight onset of OCD in children who had been previously developing normally. Dopamine is influencing the functional state of the immune system and antibodies directed against a group A beta hemolytic streptococcus can increase the, the amount of uh, dopamine. As an evolutionary perspective, since humans are the only known natural host for uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, the persistence of Sydenham's chorea and pandas in our species is attributable to our continued vulnerability as a species. So this pathogen that has made its permanent home in our bodies. Uh, there are also another evolutionary based explanations need to be considered. First is the limited power of natural selection to eliminate mutations. Particularly, recessive mutations, if their adverse effects on reproductive success are modest. Second, inbreeding, uh, which is commonplace in many cultures, to have the potential to disrupt a uh, neurodevelopmental pathways and cause early onset psycho uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, the study of evolutionary principles suggests five points. Sorry, one slide is, I don't find one of my slides. Okay, just try to skip this slide and uh, I'll tell you. Um, these conclusions um, are, the first one is many of the mental and neurodevelopmental neurodeve disorders are likely, to dis uh, are likely to persist despite their being associated with a reduction in reproductive fitness by genetic and neurobiological mechanism. Second, Intrinsic population-based nature of evolution is true at each level of understanding from linear areas of genes and genomes to population of molecules within cells uh, to collection of neurons to organized behavioral repertoires and even to collections of people in social communities. The third importance of the environment in, shape, in shaping our genome and its capacity 
to a program to maximize adaptation and diversity. Four, self-organizing character of this biobehavioral systems have the capacity to modify and recognize in response to new environmental perturbation and to settle into one or a few models of organization. And the fifth is incomplete nature of evolutionary ex uh, explanation may provide a plausible explanation of why certain vulnerabilities persist within human populations but do not account for why a particular individual is affected. Uh, I think that I should apologize you uh, for losing my last slide. Um, and I wanna thank you all for your attention. I would also like to thank Dr. Alakmand and Dr. Mahtab Motamed for helping me to prepare this presentation. Well, uh, Dr. Alakmand, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so I guess we have a few minutes, uh, hopefully to uh, have uh, some questions, uh, to raise some questions and answer. And I wanna start myself by asking this question from Jim that, um, uh, is there any clinical uh, relevance or clinical implications for evolu evolutionary perspective? Um, is there any tangible uh, immediate clinical uh, usefulness for understanding clinical ev evolutionary perspective? Uh, Professor Lechman, would you please unmute your microphone? I think I am uh, unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess I'd like to begin by just thanking Maryam for such a wonderful presentation and summary of the uh, chapter that I prepared for Dante Cicchetti and his book. Uh, really, it's really a superb presentation. So. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and in terms of the question, I guess it comes back to my clinical practice, Javad. And very frequently, when I'm evaluating a family or a child, they're mostly focused on the symptoms and what kind of distress it is causing for the child and for the family. But I also feel like it's very important for us as clinicians to focus on the strengths and interests of the child. And my very first recommendations that I put in every one of the summaries that I have prepared focuses on how to continue to develop that child's strengths and interests, because that is the way in which they will succeed in their life, uh, regardless of what the symptoms uh, may mean. So uh, for me, um, I really do think that having a evolutionary perspective and sort of seeing that the sort of long-term outcomes that we may expect from a family. And if they get too anxious, if they get too worried about their child, they may not be able to focus as much as they should on what the strengths and interests and abilities are of the child. So I'm not sure that's really a answer to your question. Um, the other thing that I will sometimes say to families is to actually go through some of the explanations that I've mentioned and actually say, just because you have these symptoms doesn't mean that you're sort of completely out of bounds in terms of what it means to be a human. And I guess uh, the question in OCD comes to mind in terms of just the parental preoccupations uh, that a parent has, and this is particularly true with the first child, and we've actually done studies where we've actually looked at the level of uh, preoccupation that is present. And if you think about it, um, the reality is that given the very high rates of infant mortality that uh, were part of our history as a species, uh, if we didn't pay such careful attention to the child in terms of being very focused on the interaction. And it's also interesting there too, although this is a bit of a sidelight, but what you see in the mothers um, is this uh, sensitive responding 
um, doing things like imitating the baby's uh, sounds that they're making. Oh, look at the little baby, look at the little baby. And building this synchrony between the child and the, and the mother. On the contrast with the fathers, uh, it's actually stimulatory play uh, where, um, you know, they throw the babies up in the air. And it makes me think of some uh, videos that I've taken of Hamid and uh, Maria uh, uh, as they actually uh, Hamid throwing the baby up in the air. Um, uh, but it's a way of sort of introducing the child to the world beyond themselves and sort of the interconnections that just exist uh, within the family structure. Um, and yesterday, uh, we had uh, a, uh, a sort of aftermath of the 4th of July uh, celebrations, and uh, there were these two wonderful children who were, you know, swinging around. I mean, it's really quite remarkable what, uh, capable, what children are capable of. But that's not really a good answer, but uh, I sometimes will go back to talking about this with families when I see them. and. Uh, but I do think focusing on the strengths and interests of the child is something that we should all do. And so often we have such a limited amount of time with the child and the family, it's actually kind of hard to do. Um, and then of course, there's a whole issue about the persistence and the commitment to the care of the child. And that's something else that as a, as a uh, profession, it would be wonderful that we can actually continue to work with the family over the course of time. And, Yes, there are a few patients that I've seen that I've followed for more than 20 years. Okay. Um, uh, I guess the conclusion I draw from uh, your explanation is something like, you know, there is a um, long-term perspective if you want to, you know, just uh, uh, look at the experimental implication uh, and this perspective, seeing through uh, things in a long term. That would be something similar to uh, perhaps uh, evolutionary effects. Like, is that something very, is, uh, in some way close to what you explained? Yes, I think having a long term perspective uh, makes a good deal of sense. And, uh, you know, so often parents are so anxious and worried about their child. Um, that their anxiety can actually have a, a negative contributing impact. Um, there's something called family accommodation, where you sort of give in to the child uh, to help them feel less anxious, but it actually, over time, actually makes the anxiety even worse. But uh, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, Javad. Oh, okay. So, okay. So maybe um, uh, other colleagues, if there is any question. Well, I'm sure Maryam must have some questions. Uh, she's clearly read the uh, chapter and uh, she's been thinking a lot about it. What, what are your thoughts? What questions do you have? One question that I was really thinking about and we were talking about it, am I, do you hear my sound? Yeah. I can't hear you too well. Um, part of my colleagues and me were talking about this chapter, this chapter um, before the session, and she asked me that you are talking about the dis dysregulations uh, which cause uh, some um, psychopathologies. But what causes these uh, dysregulations? Uh, for example, uh, we know that obsessive compulsive traits are useful, uh, but what makes them um, psychopathology? and what dysregulates them exactly. And really, I didn't have a good answer for her. Um, the thoughts about accidents or something else which is responsible for, for this, but uh, really, I don't know. Uh, I would like to know your opinion about this. Thank you. It's an excellent question and certainly one that I've thought about a fair amount. And I guess I think sometimes of what I might call a bell-shaped curve. and. Um, for many of these traits during normal development, there's a particular place where it is particularly advantageous to have, let's say, a certain degree of obsessive compulsive thoughts. But with so many other human traits, it's not just sort of one place, it's actually a whole uh, sort of curve. 
uh, with a bell-shaped uh, pattern. And it's the ones that are at one extreme or the other that are really the most vulnerable to what we would be calling psychopathology. So um, having a fairly high degree of obsessive compulsive concern about your new baby uh, can be very adaptive. But if you are completely uh, preoccupied, um, it, it, it can be a maladaptive trait. And if you don't have any concern at all about the baby in terms of having any kind of uh, obsessive compulsive uh, behaviors uh, towards the baby, that's also not to the advantage of the baby or to you and may actually set the stage for something unfortunate happening in terms of uh, the well-being of the child. So um, I think we need to think about these dimensions and actually that was something that was mentioned at the, one of the first slides that you mentioned because we are sort of looking across that entire scope. And it's one of the issues really with uh, so many of the pieces of research that I'm asked to review and that I've done is that oftentimes we're just looking at the average rather than considering what the, um, what the variations might be if, if you look at one extreme or the other. So Javad's looking very serious. No, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very serious person. I'm very serious person. Actually, other one has a question. Can you hear me, uh, I can't hear you too well. I mean, first of all, I, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing with us your point of view in this chapter. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing So I'm really having difficulty hearing you, Hamid. Uh, perhaps you could repeat the question, Javad? Um, okay. I want, okay, would you move? Yeah. Um, okay, I, I want to ask him again to, to get closer <laughs> to, to the microphone and repeat his question himself. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Professor, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, oh, thank you. Um, what I'm thinking about is uh, evolutionary speaking, uh, advantage and disadvantage is related to environment. Uh, I think it's relative. What is advantage in one environment can be disadvantage in another. And medically yes. speaking, uh, there's a vague border between what we call symptom and what can be even a talent or a gift for a child. Can we think that for some of our patients, uh, patients, the treatment is a change in this environment, in family, in the school, or in society, to cross the border, to make the symptom a talent, and uh, not change the children uh, or the child and change the environment. Well, I think that's certainly true. Uh, I think we need to work with the families to ensure that uh, the environment is as supportive as possible for the child. And I guess one of the things that you mentioned, I mean, uh, makes me think of some of the uh, individuals on the autism spectrum that I've followed. And it's so remarkable uh, that uh, many of my colleagues who are professors have certain traits that may be consistent with uh, being on the continuum uh, with being uh, autistic. And uh, depending on what profession you decide to pursue, 
uh, you can actually be very productive and successful. Um, and it's really just fascinating. One of the clinical programs that uh, I'm very uh, proud to have been a part of is where we actually bring young people together who have autism spectrum disorder and have them talk about what they would like to talk about among themselves. And uh, it's usually very, very focused and detailed, but it's really remarkable in terms of how positive and uh, interconnected they are, uh, even though they have uh, difficulties in terms of making social connections. But when you bring them together as a group, uh, they can be, and this is particularly true for the higher functioning individuals, obviously. Okay. Uh, Jim, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Lija Disapolo, has a question, uh, and he, he sent us uh, through, a, through a WhatsApp uh, messaging his question. Um, his question is on uh, a contrast between, between ecological perspective and evolutionary perspective, and what's the um, uh, what's the contrast look like? What's the contrast like? And uh, what do you think of that perspective? Well, I think uh, the ecology is something that something that we need to pay a great deal of attention to, and it has all to do with the environment. And I guess one of the things that I'll be mentioning in my presentation is uh, the whole issue with regard to uh, all of the bugs that live with us. And I guess it uh, was actually in my lifetime that we began to realize just how large our microbiome is and how many other species. And actually there are more cells in our body that do not belong to our human kind uh, than there are uh, human cells. And uh, I think the deeper we look into the interactions between ourselves and those uh, bacteria and fungi and the rest of it, um, it will be remarkable, although there's still a great deal of work to be done. But uh, thinking about the ecology and COVID-19 and uh, all of the rest of it, I really do think that that's such a, an important perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, if there is, there is no other question, perhaps uh, we could move on to, uh, to your presentation, if you, if you will. Uh, we look forward to it. Uh, and please. Well, I'd just like to begin by thanking Javan uh, for the invitation, and uh, I'm really sorry, um, and maybe inshallah, the next time I'm uh, giving a talk, I will be there in person, but um, I'll be, I'm very right. grateful. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah, excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to speak with you, and I hope the next time it will be in person. And uh, I would just say to all of our younger colleagues, you're very fortunate to be working with Javad, uh, such a wonderful and talented uh, colleague uh, who's really trying to make a difference. I guess I should also mention uh, that although I continue to be very actively involved in research, uh, having to do with the basic sciences and I can talk a little bit more about that later in terms of somatic mosaicism and a few other things. Um, it's really been something that I've been focused on as well in terms of the importance of early child development. And this actually may be evident here in terms of uh, this thing at the bottom of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. If you have any interest, you might go online and look that up um, in terms of some of the work that we're doing. But it's really clear to me that the more we invest in early childhood, and it's very clear too in terms of what's happening in the United States currently, and you know the whole issue about Black Lives Matter and the rest of it. Um, if we are actually going to make a difference and try and change direction, uh, one of the things that we really need to focus on is uh, making sure that the early development of the children is. Uh, optimal. And I have been working with colleagues. We've published papers in The Lancet and other things looking at nurturing care and some of the key elements that need to be there. But I will, uh, let's go on to the next slide, Shiva. So, um, uh, that, that, that's a good one. So I guess one of the things that I feel uh, very clearly about and pretty much every one of the presentations that I give 
is one where I will focus in part on how interconnected we all are. And when you talk to the social scientists and, uh, and others, uh, they've actually done studies where they look at how closely interconnected in terms of the social networks that we have. And uh, that's what's displayed there in the middle is the social networks. And then interestingly, if you take a closer look at the basic biology of our bodies and our brains, it's clear that no, no one neuron does anything. It's only when those neurons are interacting together and the circuit formations that they form that we're actually able to be as productive and creative as we potentially can be. And I guess the other really fascinating thing for me is that when you actually um, go out and look beyond uh, humankind, when you look beyond our planet and the rest of it, uh, the simulations that have been done uh, looking at sort of the cosmic level of dark matter and dark energy, when you look at those simulations, what you see is this interconnected uh, pattern. And um, it's really remarkable that it's constantly changing and it's all interconnected. So whether you're talking about what's happening in our brain, what's happening in our social networks, what's happening in the world today, we're all interconnected and our world is ever changing. So you can move to the next slide. So the role of immunology in uh, basic development of our bodies and our brains is something that has really been transformed over the past uh, number of years. And these are just some of the um, articles in science and biological psychiatry um, and other journals that have focused on the emerging role of the immune system. And um, I guess uh, there's actually even more issues. I probably should have put a few more in here. But for example, we'll be talking a fair amount um, about the role of prenatal programming and neuropsychiatric disorders across the lifespan. But it's an emerging area of science. And when I was in medical school, of course, when we talked to the immunologist, when we talked to the people who had expertise in this area, it was all about fighting the bugs. It was somehow the ones that were involved in protecting us. Um, and uh, what biological systems do we have in place that are uh, able to do that? And uh, it didn't have as much to do with the realities that there are. And let's, let's go to the next slide and the key points for the presentation. So the next slide. So neural development is enormously complex and dynamic. And what we've learned is that from the very early stages of brain development, immune cells play a key role in a number of processes, including the formation and refinement of neural circuits. So the first thing that we learned about the microglia, and we'll be talking more about those cells in a few minutes, is that they're actually monitoring how active the interconnection is between this neuron and that neuron. And if the interconnection isn't strong enough, those microglia actually go in and gobble up the connection, the synapse, so that there is a refinement of the circuitry that is established as a result of those cells being present. Um, but it's also clear now uh, that those immune cells are also playing an important role in the pathobiology and neural development of neuropsychiatric disorders. And that's, of course, what we'll be talking about today. And we can go on to the next slide to a figure about the crosstalk between the brain and the immune system. And uh, this is a paper that was published a few years ago in Science. And uh, it was by uh, two uh, young women based out at the University of California at Davis. And basically they were looking at what happens during the course of brain development, what happens over the course of the development of the immune system. And it also includes um, in that sort of darker blue of uh, uh, their blue green, it actually refers to what's happening during the course of gestation and how that period of time very early in uh, the formation of our bodies and our brains plays an important role. And we still have so much to learn about the placenta and other things of that sort. And then the last, no, let's go back uh, to, and the last one is the actual, the lighter green. 
And that's actually where we actually begin to see um, the role of the um, microbiome. Uh, and what's interesting there is, of course, if a child is born by um, a normal uh, vaginal delivery, uh, the microbiome gets established very early. Um, and uh, it has to do with some of the bacteria and fungi and viruses that were encountered. But interestingly, um, if you were born by cesarean uh, uh, section, that's a whole different story in terms of the patterns that you see with regard to the microbiome. So let's move to the next one. So I'm uh, convinced that the more we uh, gain a deeper understanding of the role of the immune system in neuropsychiatric disorders, I'm hopeful that novel treatments and preventative interventions will emerge, although you'll hear later in the presentation that uh, the data is not as strong as I would like it to be in terms of actually identifying specific uh, interventions that are really going to make a difference uh, with regard to um, um, uh, these disorders. But uh, if you look across the literature, what you see is that all of these different categories, um, there is a way in which the immune system plays a role, and I'll be reviewing some of the data that actually has come forward from actually looking at brain imaging studies, looking at post-mortem tissue, looking at uh, levels of cytokines in the periphery as well as in the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, but what's interesting is that it's another critique of the way in which we divide our categories with regard to neuropsychiatric disorders. And what I mean by that is that um, we have these categories like the DSM-5, but the reality is that each one of those categories is quite heterogeneous. And so there are some individuals with autism where there is a very clear set of evidence that the immune system is playing a role, and yet there are other individuals with the uh, with autism where that's less clear. Um, and we can go through that in some detail in a few minutes. Uh, there was already some mention with regard to Sydenham's chorea and pandas, and I'll very briefly mention some things about that as well. But it's also true in uh, more classic neurological diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, uh, and many somatic disorders as well. So the next slide. So as many of you know, uh, there is both the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And the innate immune system is sort of uh, there from the very beginning. And it recognizes these molecules that um, somehow um, are conserved that are associated with uh, some sort of uh, pathogenic uh, molecule. And there is this uh, nonspecific response and it leads to a maximal immediate response and it generates both cell-mediated as well as humoral components. Um, and in contrast to what we call adaptive immune system, uh, it does not have any kind of memory. So it, if you expose someone to this kind of bug and it has this kind of uh, molecule associated with it, the response is immediate and it's found very early and pretty much in all forms of life. Um, and interestingly, the adaptive immune system, which we'll talk more about too, uh, is largely only found in vertebrates. So I think we can go on to the next slide, Shiva. Yeah. So um, this is just going through this in a little more detail. The innate immune system is the first line of defense against invading pathogens. It uh, distinguishes self and non-self by recognizing these uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And these are really just very small molecules that are recognized as being associated with pathogens that can be problematic for our, our bodies. And uh, it's an immune, it's a response that's immediate and maximal from the very beginning. And uh, there are various protective mechanisms that include sort of eating up the bugs uh, and, and, and also uh, things like fever and the release of interferons and other cytokines that occur in response to the um, exposure to those pathogens. So the next slide. The next slide. So, um, so one of my favorite uh, cell types uh, that I uh, talk about far and a bit when I'm giving presentations like this um, 
And uh, there's a picture there of Beth Stevens, whose work uh, really introduced me to the importance of the microglia. But as I had mentioned earlier, uh, these cells uh, are actually ones that monitor how active the interaction is between one neuron and another. And if they're not active enough, then they get gobbled up. And it turns out that this kind of circuit formation is something that happens uh, at various times during the course of development, but particularly during very early brain development in the first few years of life. And it's actually one of the factors that has led me to be more focused in terms of some of my more recent work in terms of the importance of nurturing care and the well-being of young children. But it's also clear that uh, the microglia, and this is a picture of Beth Stevens, who really um, is up at Harvard and MIT, and has really been one of the leaders in the work that's been done with regard to the microglia. But it's also turning out that the microglia are playing an important role in a number of neuropsychiatric disorders, and it's so complex. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. So it turns out that if you look more closely at the role of the microglia, they also play a very important role very early in uh, neural development. They actually play a role in regulating the number and maturation of neural precursors and other resident uh, cell types within the central nervous system, as well as regulating the uh, outgrowth of the axons and the vascular branching. So it's not just maintaining and sort of being keeping track of the circuit connections. Uh, there are other roles that the microglia actually play. Next slide. So, um, and here you'll need to click again, uh, and you can probably click on that, and there's another thing that will come up. But it turns out that if you look in the sort of light blue portions of this, uh, you can actually see um, where the microglia emerge, and it's actually very early in the first trimester. And uh, it really is when the uh, uh, hematopoiesis actually begins. So let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, so that's exactly where the microglia uh, begin to enter the brain. Next slide. So this is a picture of, uh, I believe it's a, a mouse line, but basically what you see is um, there is, and when you look embryonically, it turns out that the embryo is initially in something called the yolk sac. And that's what's depicted here in yellow in terms of the circular structure. And it turns out that the yolk sac is also the place where the origins of our hemopoietic system begin. And uh, during that period of time, very early, very early in development, uh, there are uh, microglia that are released and then migrate in um, from the surface of the developing brain and you can see that uh, in the depiction below. And it's actually, these cells originally came from the yolk sac and they were part of what is uh, the development of our hemopoietic system, but they actually begin to migrate into the surface of the uh, developing brain very early in development, actually um, in the first trimester. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, there are a number of articles uh, that we could read about the microglia, um, and these are just two of the ones that uh, I guess I have found to be uh, of, of use. But they really do play a, an important role with regard to the developing architecture and system formation and function of our brains. Next slide. Next slide. So I'm not sure that this has actually been um, fully determined in our human species, but in some of the uh, mouse models that have been looked at, what's become clear is that there are actually differences in different regions of the brain between the microglia that you see that uh, are derived from uh, female animals versus male animals. And we could go through that in more detail, uh, but um, it's fascinating that microglia aren't one thing. They actually, depending on where you are in the brain, what your gender is, 
uh, they actually have different properties and different uh, ways of having an impact. Next slide, Javad. Yeah, so um, this is just going through some of the papers and I'll be talking about one of them in more detail. But basically people have been examining whether you're looking at uh, post-mortem brain tissue, whether you're looking at um, uh, what you can see in terms of brain imaging studies, where you can maybe use a, a PET a marker that would actually identify the microglia, or whether you're looking at other markers of the microglia. What's clear is that there is an increasing interest in the role that these microglia play with regard to the development of some of the neuropsychiatric disorders that we have been caring uh, for and treating and trying to understand better for decades. Next slide. So um, this is uh, Flora Vaccarino. She's a, a colleague of mine here at Yale, uh, who's originally from Italia. And uh, it's fascinating. We're currently doing a fair amount of work. Uh, we have two meetings a, a week uh, talking about somatic mosaicism, which is something if people are interested, I can talk a bit more about at the end. But it turns out that it isn't just what we are born with in terms of our, uh, what we inherit from our parents, but it turns out that there is genetic variation that occurs over the course of development, although much of it is uh, very early in development. So we're not just dependent on what we uh, receive from our parents in terms of our genes. But this was a study where we had a relatively small number of post-mortem brain tissue uh, specimens available from individuals with Tourette syndrome. And we were comparing that to reasonably well-matched individuals who didn't have Tourette. And um, we were particularly interested because we had also done studies earlier where we found certain uh, cell types to be missing or reduced in number uh, in the basal ganglia of individuals with Tourette syndrome. And we were expecting to see when we did a transcriptome analysis that we would see sort of lower levels of some of those uh, RNA molecules uh, present in the brains of individuals uh, who had Tourette syndrome when they were alive. And uh, it was uh, interesting because although we did find 309 down-regulated genes, we actually found even more up-regulated genes. And when we actually did a data-driven gene analysis network, we identified 17 gene co-expression novels and the top scoring down-regulated modules was enriched for interneuron transcripts, which is exactly what we were expecting to find. But it turned out that the top scoring up-regulated module was enhanced for immune genes. So the next slide. So I won't go through this in detail, but this is just basically looking at all of the different transcripts that were seen and then organizing them into these different patterns. And you may not be able to see it that well on your screen, but if you look across the bottom, you can see for each one of the nine individuals with Tourette syndrome, what column uh, they were occupying. And then you can see for the uh, control subjects, what columns they were occupying. And I guess my favorite part of this slide is if you look at the very bottom and to the very far end to the right, what you see is that there is one individual with Tourette syndrome uh, who looks more like a normal control than the other normal controls do. Uh, and it's just fascinating because it again speaks to the heterogeneity of uh, this disorder that even though it may be fairly specific in terms of the symptoms that are being presented and what you can see in terms of the motor and vocal tics, uh, there are some individuals with Tourette where it does not look like the immune system is playing nearly as an important role as, as, as others. So the next slide. And um, when we look more closely at what of the, which of the transcripts were upregulated, what genes were uh, being more widely expressed in the brains and the basal ganglia of individuals with Tourette syndrome, uh, we found evidence of um, increased activation of the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. Uh, there were multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines that were also evident, but it also placed a very clear um, a point 
to the fact that the microglia were playing an important role. Next slide. Next slide. So um, we were talking about the innate immune system, which includes the microglia. The adaptive immunity uh, system is, it includes both cell-mediated and uh, 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 components, as well as humoral components like uh, cytokines and antibodies. And it works in concert with the innate immune system uh, to eliminate or prevent pathogen growth. And it also establishes this immunological memory and this leads to an enhanced response to any subsequent encounter with that uh, particular pathogen. And of course, uh, this is the way in which vaccinations work. And of course, vaccinations are something that is a topic of real concern and focus these days, given the pandemic that we're in with the COVID-19 virus. Next slide. And I think one of the other things that's uh, fascinating to me is that oftentimes uh, when we think about um, the immune system, we think about things that are going to lead to some sort of inflammatory process. Um, and there are these helpful, help, helper T cells uh, that actually produce pro-inflammatory cytokines that actually stimulate the immune system. But interestingly, there are also anti-inflammatory cytokines that actually suppress of the immune system. And it's this sort of balance and interaction uh, that is uh, complex and, uh, and part of the reality in terms of the way in which our immune system uh, has developed. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, this is probably more complicated than uh, we need to go into a great deal of detail but it's just showing us uh, how different techniques have actually identified ways in which um, cytokines uh, can affect the neural circuitry. Uh, the PET imaging, you can't really make it out because it's uh, in white and this gray background, but this is basically talking about how um, some of the um, um, systems of the brain like serotonin and norepinephrine and, and dopamine uh, you can actually see changes um, in terms of what the role of the inflammatory cytokines can play with regard to what you see in terms of the PET imaging. Um, and interestingly, um, and that um, is something that uh, may be playing an important role. And with regard to um, uh, the other side of things in terms of depression and anxiety, it turns out that in the fMRI uh, studies that have been done, uh, what you can basically see is that there is an increased level of GABAergic uh, uh, responses that are present in uh, response to these cytokines. And um, it also, there's an increase in glutamate receptor signaling and other things of that sort. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, you can actually see with regard to um, some of the individuals who um, are um, antidepressant resistant, uh, there are actually ones that the uh, the cytokines um, are actually playing an important role in the immune system is actually getting in the way of having a good response to the classic medications that we use to treat depression and anxiety. Um, and this is a group down um, at uh, Emory University um, and uh, Jennifer uh, Flager is uh, the person who was the author of this paper and she's been very impressed, very actively involved in trying to figure out the role of the immune system with regard particularly to depression and anxiety. Next slide. So uh, now we're gonna talk a bit more about the, um, the actual paper itself that uh, uh, Estes and McAllister published in Science back in 2016. And basically what we're going to be focusing on now is what happens very early in brain development. And in this figure, you can see that it's actually divided um, and it goes halfway through gestation and uh, to the point of delivery. And then you can see there's a different time frame with regard to adolescence and adulthood. Um, and what we're going to be talking about now is what happens very early in brain development and how that really does matter. And we're going to talk particularly about maternal immune activation, 
which is a term I think that was um, originally identified by um, Estes and McAllister, uh, who were out at the University of uh, California at Davis. So the next slide. The next slide. So um, it turns out, no, so go back one slide. So um, the developing brain is sensitive to environmental signals um, and the expressions of genes that are involved in very early neural development. And it turns out that maternal immune activation, uh, which occurs during pregnancy, can have a profound impact on the developing circuits. Um, and actually, as uh, Mariam uh, mentioned earlier, there's actually fairly strong epidemiological data that link exposures to various infections during pregnancy with a greater risk of developing conditions like autism or schizophrenia. And it does appear that the microglia play a very important role uh, with regard to um, uh, maternal immune activation. And it also contributes to the brain's responsiveness to cumulative lifetime exposure to environmental insults. And it may well be that if we can actually target some of these immune related pathways, this may be a promising uh, strategy in the, in the future in terms of treatment. Although I must say I've been, for the most part, disappointed uh, that we don't have stronger evidence uh, that supports uh, uh, the use of uh, immunomodulatory interventions in the treatment of these conditions. So uh, go to the next slide, that's good. Next slide. So this is also a figure taken from that article in Science. And basically it talks about the immunological activation that occurs if a mother becomes uh, has an infectious disease process during the pregnancy. Um, it points here to increased uh, IL-6, which is actually a pro-inflammatory cytokine, how it can actually activate some of the regulatory T cells, uh, and how during the course of gestation, things that happen during um, in the placenta can also play an important role, although that whole interaction between the maternal and the fetal uh, genome and what was happening in the uh, placenta is something that we still uh, have a lot more to understand. Um, and it turns out that if you actually have a fairly high level of maternal immune activation, uh, children are at greater risk for developing um, uh, autism. But of course, the genetic background is also important. And that's another major factor in terms of the heterogeneity that we see within of these disorders. When I first started uh, studying uh, Tourette syndrome years ago, uh, we had the fantasy that we would find a single gene that is uh, responsible uh, for the condition. And although there are a few genetic rare variants that have a very high likelihood of the individual in the family developing a condition like Tourette syndrome, uh, it turns out that it's very genetically heterogeneous. And that's certainly a major factor in terms of just the general heterogeneity that we see. It also turns out that there um, are things that happen during the course of adolescence, which is another period of time uh, during adolescence where there's a major reorganization with regard to the neural circuitry in the brain and uh, what happens during that period of time with regard to environmental exposures can make a big difference as well. Um, and uh, so it turns out that if you had a high level of maternal immune activation during your gestation, uh, you may be at higher risk for other disorders later in life as well. Next slide. So uh, this is a little uh, hard to read. It's a pretty small print, but basically uh, it's just reflecting again that our genetic predisposition matters, what happens very early in development in terms of uh, hypoxia, uh, infections, uh, autoimmune disorders in the part of the mother, as well as the uh, diet and the parental age. And these are some of the other things that Mariam had actually mentioned. And um, the one thing that we haven't talked too much about uh, actually plays a role with regard to the epigenetic changes. So how the environment actually changes the level of expression of a particular transcript so that it uh, has an impact over the course of time is quite important. And you can see these four different regions with regard to neurogenesis, brain homeostasis, somatic functions, as well as uh, myelination and remyelination. And you can see the activated microglia there that are 
presented in pink. Next slide. Next slide. So this is just um, some of the evidence with regard to uh, autism spectrum disorders. Um, and here they actually had a total of 15 studies involved more than 40,000 cases. And it turned out that when you looked at maternal infection during pregnancy, it was associated with an increase of uh, autism spectrum disorders in the offspring. Uh, and this was particularly true for the ones who had a high fever that led to actually being hospitalized, the mothers being hospitalized. Um, and the risk may be modulated by the type of infectious agent, the time of exposure, the site of the infections, and uh, we're still trying to sort all of that out. But it turns out that there's evidence that maternal infections and maternal immune activation uh, can play an important role with regard to a number of these uh, disorders. The next slide. So here's another uh, very important uh, issue uh, that I think uh, we need to pay attention to, and it has to do with early life adversity and uh, how that can impact uh, the, um, our uh, immune system and how it can affect the brain circuitry that we see. And uh, this early life adversity and emotional and physical health across the lifespan. And there's this autoimmune neuroimmune network hypothesis. And the next slide actually has a depiction of that in terms of a figure. So the next slide. So here um, we see uh, over the course of development, and that's the uh, arrow at the very bottom, and this was published by Nisak and Miller back in 2016. And over the course of development, what you can see there, and then what we're looking at at the side is what the impact is of early life stress. And basically what you can see is that uh, there are changes that occur as a result of uh, stress occurring early in life. And um, basically um, it can result in a low grade inflammation. And this is actually, you can see it up here on top, low grade inflammation by the microglia and um, it can actually have an impact in terms of the level of, of, of uh, the activity in the uh, HPA axis, the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, the stress response system, and how that can set the stage uh, for um, problems occurring later in the individual's life in terms of reduced cortical uh, basal ganglia reward sensitivity uh, so that you, um, are more likely to behave in, uh, in ways that uh, uh, don't require some sort of sense of reward. And it can lead to risky behaviors um, and um, you know, maladaptive behaviors of one sort or another. Next slide, next slide. So this brings me to another topic that I guess I'm really quite fascinated by. And uh, the more we learn about the microbiome, we realize that we actually have co-evolved with these bugs and bacteria and fungi uh, over the course of our evolution. And of course, they precede us in terms of our evolutionary history. I've recently been reading a book uh, called, I think, The Entangled Life uh, by a remarkable author, um, uh, Meryl Shedrick. But uh, the more we learn about the um, role that our, the various uh, fungi and uh, bacteria and viruses play in terms of our developing nervous system and our world as we know it, it's very clear to me that uh, we'll be playing, uh, these will be playing an important role in the future. And I think if I were younger, uh, this is one of the areas that I probably would be paying more attention to in terms of my ongoing research work. Um, but uh, there are at least 10 times more non-human cells than human cells in our bodies. And the more we realize, uh, the more we learn, the more we realize uh, that our health and well-being really depends in part on these organisms. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, um, it's usually right at the time of delivery uh, that uh, our microbiome gets started and um, people have begun to characterize that in more detail and people have looked at it 
with regard to whether you were born by uh, a vaginal delivery versus one by a cesarean section and how that dramatically changes the composition of the microbiome. And as we'll be talking about in a few minutes, uh, people have actually been trying to sort of reprogram the microbiome of some individuals and people have looked more closely at individuals with certain conditions and seeing what kind of variations there might be in their microbiome within individuals with this kind of disease versus another. So the next slide. So as I mentioned, within the first moments of life uh, following birth, we're colonized by these uh, commensal microbiota. So usually when we think of these uh, bacteria and the rest of it, we were thinking about things that would be risky and challenging to us, but it turns out that we've actually co-evolved with these organisms and uh, we're actually dependent on them uh, in terms of their functioning. Um, and it's important not only for our uh, bodies, but also for our brains. And indeed, uh, alterations in the microbiota can activate neural pathways and influence uh, stress-related behaviors. And there's another figure on the next slide that we can talk more about in a moment. But our microbiome is also ever-changing. Um, and this is just uh, looking at what's going on with regard to the gut microbiome, the genes and proteins, the metabolites that they produce, and what the uh, actual impact is in terms of how uh, they, uh, but the, the next slide is probably the more important one. And this is basically what is called the gut-brain axis. And uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at this with regard to uh, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar illness, um, relatively few with regard to obsessive compulsive and, disorder and Tourette syndrome. But basically, it turns out that what's going on with regard to the bacteria in our gut is actually uh, having an impact with regard to what's going on in uh, the brain circuitry. And actually, um, those impacts are actually coming down and having an effect with regard to our HPA axis and uh, our adrenergic system, among other things. Um, next slide. Next slide. So um, this is uh, a, a study that uh, actually reports on the microglia undergoing differential phases discernible by uh, uh, signatures that you can see in the transcriptome that diverge from males and females. And remarkably, the absence of microbiome in germ-free mice uh, at a time um, had a sexually dimorphic impact both prenatally and postnatally, and the microglia were much more profoundly perturbed in the male embryos compared to the female embryos. It also demonstrated that the microglia respond to environmental challenges in a sex and time-specific manner um, from prenatal stages. And these findings have major implications for understanding the role of the microglia with regard to um, its uh, contributions to health and disease. Uh, but it's interesting, this is an animal study that um, I found fascinating that we can talk more about if people are interested. Um, so, um, what about um, what's going on in our brain? And let's go to the next slide. So this was, uh, I was actually at the Society for Neuroscience meeting back in 2018. And uh, there was a group of individuals, I believe, uh, from Emory University uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia where they actually presented a finding that actually that there were bacteria that appeared to be present in healthy human brains um, as well as in mouse brains. And um, I, I looked this up yesterday um, to see whether or not this has been cited and whether the paper itself has been published. Uh, but um, it turns out that so far um, it has not been published uh, in a scientific journal, although it caused a fair amount of interest and uh, there are various uh, sort of uh, speculations about it that are present in the, uh, in the scientific literature. Uh, but it's fascinating that we may even have some of those bacteria not only in our gut, not only in our skin and, and our digestive system, uh, but also in our brains as well. 
Next slide. So um, this is just to repeat again that this is an important emerging area of science that we still have a great deal to learn about. And what it raises now is um, what some of the unanswered questions are. And uh, let's move on to the next slide. So um, as we were talking about earlier, uh, these are heterogeneous conditions that uh, we can uh, present and that we have some awareness of. But are there specific immune-related subtypes of any of these disorders that we can characterize well? And will a deeper understanding of the role of the immune system uh, play uh, an important role in terms of our ability to treat and possibly even to prevent uh, some of these conditions from emerging? Uh, given the importance of what's happening very early in development of the brain and the body. Next slide. Next slide. So um, there are a number of uh, studies that have begun to um, take a look at whether or not altering uh, the immune system can actually have an impact with regard to treatment of uh, some of these disorders, including autism, depression, and schizophrenia. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, these actually uh, play an important role in actually uh, helping to uh, reduce the uh, severity of the symptoms that you might see. And these are just some of the numbers in terms of studies that have been conducted and numbers of subjects that have participated and for whom the data is available. So the next slide. And um, actually, a few years ago, I guess it was maybe um, um, a year ago at the meeting of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, uh, Chris McDougall, who trained here at Yale and is a friend and colleague who's now up at Harvard, uh, asked me to be the discussant um, in a panel that he had that focused on the role of the immune system in autism. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, there have been all sorts of immune modulatory interventions that have been tried uh, in the case of individuals with autism, whether it be the use of corticosteroids. Um, um, you can see some of the other compounds that have been tried. They've even done some IVIG studies. Um, and um, interestingly, there's a, a group out in California and Arizona that have actually been doing uh, transplantation and sort of re recreating and reorganizing uh, the microbiome of some individuals with, uh, with autism. And so far, um, there are none of the immunomodulatory interventions that have consistently been shown to have a positive impact in terms of the outcomes that you see with regard to uh, autism, uh, with the possible exception of these um, fecal transplantation uh, programs. So next slide. So this is the study that I mentioned that uh, group out in California, uh, UCLA, but also the group in Arizona have been working on. And they basically uh, do a number of things to completely eliminate the individual's microbiome as best they can. And then to reintroduce, um, and this is actually using uh, microbiota that have been collected and, and sort of cleansed in some way um, from other individuals who don't have this disorder and then following what the long-term outcomes are of individuals who've actually had this uh, uh, microbiome transfer uh, therapy. And um, I would have to say that, uh, that there's a great need for replication. Uh, this particular paper is just presenting the results of the initial um, trial um, in terms of exploratory analyses and it wasn't a, a randomized control trial. It was simply just looking at what was the impact in uh, a small number of individuals with regard to um, this uh, myo microbiota transfer therapy. So this is something that is interesting in terms of just how important the microbiome is, but how can we actually change things? Next slide. So another um, interesting possibility um, is um, transplantation of uh, stem cells. 
And here they actually uh, used the uh, stem cells that were derived from a sibling of an individual uh, who had a severe schizophrenia, and they actually did a uh, um, stem cell transplantation into the individual with schizophrenia after um, trying to reduce the number of, uh, of uh, what the activation was within their immune system. Interestingly, people have also tried for treatment-resistant schizophrenia bone marrow transplantation, um, and uh, it's really uh, remarkable whether or not any of these things can be replicated and be um, important contributions. But of course, thinking about the possibility of something like a bone marrow transplantation seems pretty unlikely in terms of just uh, how complicated a process that actually is. So if we could do the next one. So this is just from that paper um, where they were looking at the um, transplantation and they were, this was one case where they were looking at the severity of the, um, and I think that's the um, uh, scale that looks at both positive and negative uh, symptoms with regard to schizophrenia. And you can see how uh, dramatically reduced that was after the bone marrow transplantation and the individuals uh, overall a global assessment and quality of life also increased dramatically. So whether or not that can be replicated and whether or not that is something that we need to pay more attention to, but there clearly are some cases uh, where you can actually see a fairly dramatic change once you actually change the uh, uh, composition of, of the bone marrow of an individual. Next slide. So um, this is a, another interesting article uh, that um, is a little hard for you to see all of the details, but it's basically uh, discussing how different uh, inflammatory mediators can actually have a beneficial impact with regard to uh, mood disorders. Uh, this is actually a colleague, uh, Madeline uh, uh, Fu, who's down at uh, Mount Sinai uh, Hospital down in uh, New York City. And you can't see it very well, but it's looking at uh, ways in which uh, different compounds, whether it be riluzole or aminocycline or the probiotics or other things of that sort. And they even talk about at the bottom the possibility of actually coming up with a vaccination against stress in terms of what the impact is with regard to uh, the immune system activation. So I didn't really go through that in enough detail, uh, but let's go on to the next slide. So this is a paper that I'm one of the co-authors for, and we did a study with uh, Susan Swedo down at the National Institutes of Health uh, before she retired. And basically it's looking at this condition that is uh, described as being pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with streptococcal infections. And um, this comes in part from her interest in uh, things like Sydenham's chorea that were really pretty well documented as being a consequence of being exposed to group A streptococcal infections. But it's really fascinating. Um, it turns out that although we may call uh, a strep infection, um, a group A strep infection, there are other kinds of strep bacteria as well. Uh, there are actually different uh, sort of clans or groups of uh, strep bacteria, group A strep bacteria that vary from uh, one uh, individual to another. And it turns out that there are certain uh, strains of strep that are probably more vulnerable of causing something like Sydenham's chorea and possibly something like pandas. There actually was an epidemiological study that was done out in California where they actually found that uh, individuals um, who had been exposed to a certain strain of strep were much more likely to develop these neuropsychiatric conditions. And as uh, uh, Maryam was mentioning, uh, What's interesting about the PANDAS concept is that it reflects a very sudden onset, the acute onset of obsessive compulsive symptoms, sometimes some tics, but also a whole range of other symptoms, including anxiety and um, disruptive behaviors uh, can also change it. Uh, issues having to do with sleep, with uh, 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 enuresis, other kinds of uh, symptomatology as well. But uh, interestingly, in this study, what we did was, even though the families were screened and brought in from across the United States to the intramural program at NIMH down in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, 
uh, our group actually here at Yale was the group that was responsible for um, actually conducting the clinical assessments. So let's go on to the next slide, Chippa. So it, it turns out that Kyle Williams uh, is now up at Harvard. He trained with us. Uh, he's actually, his, uh, his clinic is completely devoted to uh, looking at the ways in which the immune system can be uh, involved in terms of neuropsychiatric problems and various treatments. He's the person I go to if I want uh, to have someone receive uh, intravenous gamma globulin or other kinds of interventions that are immune modulatory in nature. And uh, this was published, I guess, a few years back in uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal. Next slide. So um, we didn't have as many subjects as we would need to actually have a, a very clear result, but what we did find was that um, there was a modest benefit that was seen to the IVIG individuals that you can see there. And uh, interestingly, um, the comparison occurs over time is something that continues. Um, it wasn't statistically significant, um, but there was a mean improvement from baseline that was uh, uh, pretty significant at week 24 as we followed these uh, subjects up over time. And we've actually continued to follow them um, uh, to one degree or another uh, since the trial was completed a few years ago. Next slide. So um, I guess it's pretty obvious from um, what I've been saying that uh, neural development is enormously complex and dynamic, constantly changing, but all this interconnection. And it's clear that from very early in brain development, immune cells play a key role in a number of processes, including the actual formation and refinement of circuits. And it's also clear that the immune system plays an important role in the pathobiology uh, of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions as well. So if we can have the next slide. Next slide. So uh, I had, uh, I think, presented this slide earlier, um, but uh, one of the things that is very clear to me, and hopefully it's probably pretty clear to you at this point as well, is that the more we learn, uh, the less we truly understand. And I guess that's particularly true with regard to um, the uh, uh, compounds and the uh, viruses and bacteria and fungi that we have co-evolved with, uh, how that plays an important role. But we still are at the very early stages of having a deeper understanding of the role of the immune system with regard to the development of these uh, conditions. And I guess I'm still hopeful, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where things are at 10 years from now with regard to the development of immune modulatory interventions that can truly have a real impact in a positive way um, with our patients. Next slide. Next one. So um, there are many multidirectional interconnections across multiple biological systems in our brains and our bodies that are mediated in part by our immune system. But the promise of the field remains far greater than our current deliverables, what we're actually able to do to try and help individuals with these conditions that are based on the role of the immune system is not as great as I would hope it would be, but I guess I'm hopeful that novel interventions will be developed that can make a positive difference in the care of our patients. And it's also possible that we will be able to identify specific biomarkers that actually will allow us to guide a more personalized approach to treatment. And this comes back to the genetic heterogeneity of all of these disorders, as well as the fact that even though we have them lumped into these categories, uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or um, you know, one thing after another, uh, they're not one condition, they're actually this composite of multiple uh, disorders. Next slide. So um, I've just added one more uh, figure to this and this is our microbiome. Uh, but again, uh, it just reflects again how interconnected we are uh, in our world, and it's not just interconnections between one individual and his friends and community, but it's also 
what's happening in our bodies with regard to the interconnections that we have with these uh, uh, various uh, biological uh, cells that are involved um, in that we have co-evolved with over time. Next slide. So I think we have time probably for uh, a few questions, but uh, thank you again for taking the time. And uh, I wish I was able to um, provide even clearer a perspective with regard to the importance of this. Uh, but thank you again, Javad, for the invitation. Uh, shukran. Um, so what is the proper way in Farsi to say thank you? Is it, it's a, is it a version of uh, Shukran? Uh, um, the, easiest, the easiest one is Merci, which is French. Yes. Merci. <laughs> Merci. But uh, Mochaka is another one. Mamnoon. I thank you very much. It was fascinating as always. Um, it was uh, um, very interesting in many ways. For uh, to me, the concept of microbiome and its implication was uh, very. Uh, novel and very interesting, and uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I hope uh, everyone who has listened to you uh, has um, has learned as well. I, 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 and I'm sure that will be the case. Uh, just one brief question I have um, with, is with regards to prevention. Are we closer to any uh, prevention strategy, knowing uh, all of these? Sort of things to mention. Um, in other words, uh, is there any uh, implication with regards to implication given uh, our understanding, our new understanding of uh, immunology in, this, uh, in relation to psychiatric conditions? Well, that's a wonderful uh, question. And uh, I guess for me, it points again to the importance of what's happening very early in brain development during the gestation and the maternal immune activation. And um, one of the other realities, of course, is that the amount of stress that a mother feels during the pregnancy is another factor that can actually influence the developing, uh, not only the developing uh, immune system, but also the developing uh, brain systems as well. So anything that we can do to ensure that a child has adequate nurturing care and this brings me back to some of the articles in uh, Lancet uh, that we published a few years back with regard to the importance of nurturing care. And it also was one of the avenues that led me to focus more of my work recently on early child development. And we've actually been doing studies in Beirut. We just published a few studies uh, looking at a, a group of mothers coming together um, and trying to do their best to raise their children and actually forming those interconnections was something that was critically important in terms of, of the success of that program. Um, I'm not sure it's uh, something I should mention, but we're also working very actively with uh, a pediatrician who trained at Yale, who's now doing a early childhood intervention in Riyadh um, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, we have uh, good friends in Brazil and um, interestingly, uh, goes back to the conversation about the evolutionary uh, origins of psychopathology. But the person who was the editor of that uh, textbook, Dante Cicchetti, um, is uh, very interested in the role of stress and all sorts of other things with regard to psychopathology. He's also the editor of a journal called Development and Psychopathology. And uh, he asked me to write a uh, a um, sort of a, a celebratory article for our colleague Ed Ziegler, who was uh, a colleague of mine here at Yale uh, for many years before he passed away a couple of years ago. And interestingly, uh, that reflects on the uh, work that we've been doing with colleagues in the UK. And interestingly, in I think seven or eight different conflict to reach, uh, conflict affected regions of the world, and I invited actually um, a number of my colleagues that are part of that exercise to contribute to this larger article. And it'll be published soon, but there are actually, I think, 24 different authors. And they include individuals from, uh, from Mali, uh, from uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kajikistan, from Vietnam, uh, from 
uh, Brazil, as well as from Saudi Arabia, as well as Dr. Ghassan Issa, who is based there in um, Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, but basically, uh, the importance of early child development, and it's particularly true thinking about what's happening during the course of the gestation. So if we can actually help mothers and help them through uh, that period of time, that's such a critical period of time for our brain development and body development, I'm sure that we will have less uh, psychopathology in the future. So that's one way of uh, sort of pursuing things with regard to prevention. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I guess um, we have time for just one question, if there is any, uh, any question. Okay. Uh, just, uh, there are two things left. Uh, uh, the first one is, uh, I, um, I want to have your words for having uh, the next presentation sometime soon with your uh, participation. Uh, I wish I have your words. Um, and second of all, our colleagues at the university has prepared a uh, certificate of appreciation um, uh, just to say thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to our next conversation and, uh, and uh, one day at a time. Okay. Uh, Professor Lechman, yeah. Dr. Yes, Aloha. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you for accepting our invitation again, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we all enjoyed the uh, insightful lectures and interesting discussions we have today. Uh, I would like to offer the certificate of appreciation signed by Dr. Aloha, Dr. Muhammad Hussein Nebukar, and Dr. Rami Kordi. And I would hope that we can uh, continue our collaboration uh, with you, uh, with GLS and uh, Yale University, uh, in different aspects of uh, psychiatry and psychology. And thank you again for joining us today. If there is anything you would like to add, no, I'm just very grateful, and I, I mentioned earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Good friend.